history does seem to be repeating itself with the Cold War, fascism, pogroms, and all of that. How do you see that? Is it repeating itself? Is there, or is it different this time? It's actually both. So to understand what's going on in Europe, we've got to have an understanding of European history. So ever since the disintegration of the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD, which followed the disintegration of their legions and their military in the 4th century AD, up from that point in time up until 1945, Europe was in a constant state of never-ending war between tribes, between nobles, between nation-states. What stopped that force of history in 1945 was in the 19th century, the Europeans, Brits, the French, the Germans, had to go out and build empires. That's why, because they had to get massive amounts of raw materials and natural resources to feed their new industrial bases. Well, oversimplification again, but you get the picture. Yeah. And of course, they end up fighting over things that eventually culminates in World War I, then World War II. The whole thing's blown to hell. The U.S. and her allies end up in control of Western Europe, the Red Army in the East, and the combination of, you know, the American and British occupation of Germany and Western Europe and the Russian occupation of Eastern Europe stopped more or less the wheel of history. What the United States did, and analysts like Peter Zihon have summed this up very well, we took a look at the Red Army. We said, okay, that's a serious fighting force right there. We were not sure we could beat them if we actually got into a fight. George S. Patton thought he could, but we know he got you know, most likely assassinated. Uh, he may or may not have been right or wrong, but George Marshall and Eisenhower didn't think we could do it. And so we look at the, what the Red Army was able to do, the sheer number of people they kill and the casualties that the Russians were able to sustain and still steamroll over Eastern Europe. We didn't think we could beat them. So we said, mm -hmm. okay, what do we do? So we made the Europeans a deal. I said, look, guys. We're going to use the United States Navy to secure all the world's sea lanes so that you guys can import raw materials and export a finished product to the North American market. And you won't have to build big militaries or empires again because the U.S. Navy is going to do for you what your empire would have done. That's why ever since 1945, the primary use for the U.S. Navy and to a lesser extent the Marine Corps was to eliminate piracy and secure those sea lanes, mm -hmm. which is why... Anytime some group of knuckleheads attacked a major sea lane or went after one of our allies' trade, we responded like that and we smacked them pretty hard. We wanted to set that up so that they could rebuild their economies. And then, of course, comes the United States' famous deal with the devil, with the Saudis, who we really underestimated just what yeah. a problem they could be. So we said, look, we'll secure the Persian Gulf so we can get cheap Middle Eastern oil from the Saudis to basically fuel nations like South Korea, Japan, and the Western Europeans to rebuild their economies so that they could build reasonably sized militaries to hold back the communists, hold back the Red Army. The best analysis on that still comes from Peter Zihon. He just sums it up better. I'm still oversimplifying, but that was what we did. Right. Now, the deal was the United States will do all this for you. We'll even fight wars for it, which is kind of what we did in Desert Storm. But you got to be on our side. And you have to let the United States write your security policy because the last time we let you Europeans do things on your own, some guy who yells Zeke Heil comes to power and then we're ginned up in a war that kills tens of millions. So we don't want that to happen again. The Europeans are like, okay, where do we sign? So that's where NATO comes from. And the whole reason was to hold back the Russians. And there were other problems. The United States was not energy independent and the Saudis could still kind yeah. of yank our chain. Well, we fast forward a few decades. As of 2019, the North American continent, the U.S. and Canada, pretty much 100% energy independent. They got all the energy options they need in their own borders. So why would we care what happens in the Middle East? We start drawing down, draw a lot of our forces out of Europe. But then certain things start to happen, and then the Europeans start to act like Europeans again. So, best example. As the Cold War progressed, we tried to go, instead of so much energy independence, we tried to have a crash program between the U.S., Canada, Britain, and Germany, and the French to go nuclear, basically meaning all of our electricity generated by nuclear power. Mm -hmm. The only country that was successful was the French, 
The reason the others failed is because the Russians ran a very effective subversion operation. A lot of the anti-nuclear weapon, anti-nuclear movement, we've always suspected some of the leaders were Russian sleepers. They mm -hmm. fanned the flames. The reason was is the only export the Russians could make money off of was yeah. exporting oil and gas. So that was an existential threat to them, and they responded appropriately. Well, the United States didn't like that too much. So when President Reagan came to power, we had a three-pronged way of bringing the Russians to their knees. One was the conventional military buildup to make sure they didn't think they could take us in a conventional fight. Two was the Star Wars program. And three, and probably most importantly, we cut some deals with the Saudis to give their royal family U.S. military protection in exchange for them crashing oil prices. That crippled the Soviet Union's economy and ultimately is what contributed to them going to their knees in 1992. But then we have other problems. Yeah. The nuclear weapons trafficking issue becomes a thing. And the Russians have a 60% drop in birth rate like that almost overnight. Millions of people die from alcoholism, tuberculosis, which is still happening. And millions of young, good-looking Russian women flee, either flee the country or are trafficked out as mail-order brides or to work in the brothels of Western Europe. And the Western European governments liked all the tax revenue from those brothels, so they told their counterintelligence services, turn a blind eye to it. they did. 